2022. Our first speaker today is Daniel Lowen, who is the technical director at Sealing Technologies, an experience with defensive cyber operations and engineering. He's worked on programs throughout the DOD specializing in providing enterprise level security. Right. Hello, welcome. Uh, I look, I'm actually surprised how many people are here. I wasn't expecting this, uh, this many, um, especially this more uh, early. So um, how many people here do DCO? I'm going to guess most people um, do some sort of defensive cyber operations. Uh, how many people do data science? Actually, more than I was expecting, a little bit. Um, who's trained in data science, like actually legit? So we got two. So you guys are going to think I'm a joke. Um, so, um, so I've most spent most of my time doing DCO. Um, I've, I've had about 15 years. I was originally doing uh, <coughs> network monitoring back in the day when like Snort was cool and uh, you know we were happy when we could collect like handful of logs, like at 100 logs a second, and we'd be like, yeah, this is awesome, right? Um, things have sort of changed over the time. Um, I'm not a data scientist, but I kind of got put in a role where I had to learn it, like I'm sure a lot of you have, have done over the year. Um, so I have a lot more experience with doing the DCO side of things. So um, it's a good kind of introduction to me. So the, the purpose of my talk is it's really aimed at um, I know some DCO, I know like what an attack is, I know how to monitor and so forth, um, but I don't necessarily know data science and here's kind of my experience with learning. Um, at the end I wanted to make it so that everything was hands on and that you could do it relatively easily at home. So I wanted to prevent, I wanted to not require like a large infrastructure in order for you to start doing data science. And I'll kind of show you how you can get started. Uh, it's really not that hard. If you know Python, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to, to start learning. Uh, so goal is not to teach you everything within an hour um, because that's just not going to happen. Uh, however, my hope is that by the end of this, you actually understand what's available to you and where you can start going to try to learn more. Um, that's really my, my purpose and what I was aiming to do from this. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what machine learning is, supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, we're going to talk about the data science process that generally occurs. Um, throughout both of these, I'm going to try to tie it back to DCO, uh, not just DCO, but security in general. Um, and then I have three demos at the end. Um, we're going to use Jupyter Notebooks. Um, again, they've been designed so that if you have a decently co computer at home, you could do it. Uh, it's not like you require a ton of infrastructure to get started. And I'll also then sort of talk about how you could try to scale this afterwards. So once you've learned the basics, uh, I'll give you some, some tips about how, how we can start scaling it so that you could actually start monitoring a much larger infrastructure. Um, so types of machine learning. Uh, there's when I started looking into it, there was a handful of different types, uh, but these are the large, broad categories. So supervised, unsupervised, and there's another one that isn't really too much of interest to us, but it's natural language processing. Um, supervised learning is a little more mature. It, tend, it means that you are feeding it data. So each data is labeled in some way, and I'll kind of go a little more in detail to that. So you're spending the time up front to take objects or features, uh, is what the data science world calls it, and you're saying this is X and this is Y and this is X, and that's how the computer starts to learn. Um, the problem is, I'm sure you can already tell, it requires somebody to teach it. <laughs> um, so people like to try to get to results faster. So the second one is unsupervised learning, um, and it's generally a little bit less mature. Uh, but it still has uses, and that's actually what we're going to mostly be looking at, uh, just because it's a little easier and a little bit faster uh, for the demos. So unsupervised is basically you feed it a whole bunch of data, and then it does something, and it's like, is this useful? It doesn't necessarily know that, like, I don't really know what I'm looking at as a computer, but I've sort of categorized these, and you just then have to kind of look at it and say, yeah, that actually is useful, or no, that's definitely not useful. 
Um, so you kind of try to push the work towards the back end as opposed to the front end. Um, natural language processing is actually really cool, and I started looking into it a lot, but it's, it's really a way for computers to understand written text. Um, we had a weird thing, and I was able to do some really, really cool things with it, um, but it's, I don't think it's super relevant to DCO, maybe like um, insider threat type stuff, um, but not, not as relevant. All right, so types of supervised learning. Um, big thing is used is for classification. So uh, my example here is if you hired a bunch of people to literally go through images all day and um, you knew that all your pictures were cats and dogs, but you didn't know which one was which. So you would hire somebody and they would say, oh, look, this picture is a cat. This picture is a dog. And they would feed it to the computer with the idea that over time, it would be able to start recognizing what a cat and a dog was. Pretty simple. Um, there are, in the industry, there are a lot of different weird jobs on Mechanical Turk, if you're familiar with that, that is literally just doing this. It's, it's categorizing things. You can get a job not making a whole lot of money and just sit there all day, and, and you just categorize things for these computers to start learning. Um, this is actually a real big problem for us because we can't usually do Mechanical Turk, especially where I work. Most of our customers aren't going to be like, oh yeah, you can just send our data to random people on Amazon and have them sit there for you know, 50 cents an hour and categorize all our data. It, it doesn't, doesn't work too much. Um, so it's one of the big problems with our, our field. Um, another one, uh, Naive Bayes. Um, it's a little different in that you kind of specify what the data science world calls features. So maybe you're like looking at a feature and this picture is the color, for example, and maybe like the type of stem or something like that. Um, with Naive Bayes, you have to have some sort of response. So that's like you are correct or you are wrong or something like that. It's called Naive because it starts off literally just guessing. So like in our case, we have like I guess it's a pomegranate and an apple, and you feed it the first pomegranate, and it, it has no idea, so it just makes something up, right? Um, and then you say yes or no, and then as time goes on, it's slowly, slowly going to get better and better and better. Um, the more data you feed it, the longer you feed it, the, the better it's going to get with time. Uh, so some examples of CND, some of these are very, uh, some examples of how this is used. Um, image detection, if you've ever used like Google Maps or Apple Photos, it's used now heavily. Uh, you can search like, type in bird, and it shows you all the birds in your photos, right? Uh, somebody has sat there and they have started classifying that. They've gone through pictures and they have said, this is a bird, this is a bird, this is a bird, and eventually the computer starts to learn these things. Um, some uses within the security realm, uh, probably the biggest is the one that we all hate. Um, <clears throat> how many people love the uh, click on all the crosswalks and click on all the stop signs from all the, the signs? The crazy thing about those is you're actually teaching cars to drive. I don't know how many people know that, but the, the reason that they're doing that, that's a sort of free service and they're selling that data to all the car manufacturers, they're trying to figure out how to make like your Tesla just drive itself. Um, and so what they're doing is they basically, they know some of them, but they don't know others, and they don't know, like they haven't categorized it, and so they're having you sit there and, and teach it what a stop sign is. Um, spam detection has been around for a very long time. Uh, when you click on this is spam, it goes back to Google or whoever it is, um, and then they will say, look at that message, and then they will start training an algorithm uh, that, that will mark that as spam. Antivirus uses it. I have seen a handful of products for like seam alarms relevance. So hey, I just keep seeing you marking this as false positive. Um, we've seen it 100 times. You know, It's always been a false positive. Maybe we should downgrade the severity or something along those lines. Um, regression testing. Regression testing we've been using for a while. Um, for regression to work, 
you work with continuous data of some sort, which in the DCL world, we generally deal with a lot of time series data, right? Um, so uh, this has been pretty relevant. I mean, I, we've been doing this for about 10 years now in the DCO space. So something simple like um, how much data is coming out of a box on average, right? So what you do is you just say, hey, this system, you know, we get ebbs and flows every day and we, we go out and we predict what is normal and then we, we say, hey, flag any time that it's outside of normal. Um, it's a pretty, pretty uh, mature, mature space. Um, but that is a supervised type learning. Um, so uses outside of C DCO and, and computer network defense in general. Uh, forecasting of prices, goods, stocks. Um, and then uses just anything that's time series and has a value, you could definitely use regression for. Um, all right, so unsupervised learning. Clustering, um, going back to our dogs and, dogs and cats example. Um, so in this case, we throw out a bunch of pictures of dogs and cats, and at the end of it, it just gives us two buckets, and it says, I don't know what these are, but these seem to be related, right? Um, and then somebody goes through at the end and looks at a handful of them and says, oh, these are dogs, and these are cats. Um, it can be a little bit faster, but it generally is less accurate. So, but sometimes, like, accuracy, especially when you're, like, looking for weird things, isn't always 100% needed, especially if it's giving you some false positives and not too many false positives. So just give me what's weird, and then I'll deal with, instead of this much data, now I can look at this much data. And that still is of great use to us. Um, uh, one of the ones that we're actually going to look at in our example is isolation force. Um, so isolation force really just is a way to detect anomalies. Um, so you feed it a bunch of data, the data can be interlinked. You might not necessarily know what is, like you're not saying, hey, this is anomalous if this happens. You just feed it the data and it just says, hey, I see an anomaly. I don't know if that's a value to you. I don't know if you actually care about that, but you, you know, it's an anomaly. That's, that's all it's going to tell you. Um, so we feed it into something called an isolation forest, and it will take all our data and it will mark it as anomalous or not. We say we want 20% or 10% of the data to be um, anomalous. Uh, it also has an auto feature, which will adjust that for you, and it gives you what, what it sees as anomalous, and then you, you comb through it, and now you have 20% of your data instead of 100%. Um, another one that's heavily used is k-means. So k means basically it takes all your data and it groups it into clusters. So you tell it how many clusters you want um, and it gives you clusters and then says are any of these clusters of value to you? And you then have to figure out if, if, if it found anything of use. <clears throat> um, so some uses outside of CND. Um, Group websites based on content would be one uh, that I can think of. Uses within security, sorting processes by their actions. So maybe it's like, what do most applications do? And then group them in the clusters. And if they're outside of those clusters, or maybe we have like a malicious cluster, that's now bad. Um, you could do something like sorting DNS queries into buckets using isolation force. So that, that's actually my example is going to be finding DNS tunneling using isolation forest and, and k-means uh, for, for using Zeek logs. Um, association. Uh, so this is, I have multiple pieces of data, lots, like a huge data set, but I don't know if they're interrelated or not. I, I don't know like if X and Y, is there some sort of pattern that I might not recognize? Um, the most popular one is, is actually heavily used in the shopping industry. So it's called, I'm gonna probably say it wrong, a priori, which means uh, from what was before, um, this one actually made the news. It's kind of a fun story. It, it happened a while ago. Uh, it was Target basically was using this algorithm and there was a particular shopper who started doing a certain set of 
buying habits, and Target started sending the family uh, things like getting ready for a newborn. And um, at the time, she didn't know she was pregnant, and her dad was very upset. And she, they wrote a letter to Target being like, this is inappropriate. Why are you sending my, my teenage daughter pregnancy things? And then a few weeks later, he sent them a sorry letter saying she is, in fact, pregnant. So, um, so <clears throat> you just basically feed it a pile of data, which is, in this case, these people tend to buy these things together. You're not saying, like, you know, what is the interrelations. You, you don't actually know. And what it does is it starts finding interlinks. So people that buy candy tend to buy soda or wh whatever that, that is. Um, so in that, they, they have something called support. So if people buy X, do they also tend to buy Y, right? Confidence is, is that always the case? Every time someone buys this, they always buy this, right? So we probably want to put them on the shelf together. Um, and then lift is, how unique is Y to X? So maybe people only ever buy Y when they also buy X. And it comes up with values and interlinks, like a graph database, and says these are the things that are interrelated, and that's how they decide what to put on the shelves where. If you've ever worked in the retail industry, you will know that you will constantly be getting things to rearrange everything on the shelf to try to you know, make us spend as much money as possible. Uh, so uses outside of CND, I already pretty much covered them pretty well. Um, some examples of how this could be useful, log on, log off time. So categorizing users and, and trying to figure that out. Programs, so hey, these classes of users tend to run these types of programs. And then looking, oh, hey, why is this one user who's an accountant running a whole bunch of PowerShell, right? Um, uh, utilization of administrative functions, something along those lines could be useful. <coughs> All right, so how am I doing on time? All right, so uh, the next, next thing I'm going to actually talk about is what is the general process for just doing data science. Uh, it's not necessarily in Python ex exclusively, but uh, it's kind of what I'm comfortable with. And most people that are doing data science is either in R or Python. Um, and people in R space tend to be more comfortable with Python, so I think it makes a little more sense. Um, all right, so what is the basic flow of data science in general? Uh, and some people will disagree. I've seen a couple of different ones, but this is kind of the, the general overall flow. Um, so gathering data, so figuring out how we're going to gather all this data. This is something that we have been dealing with in the DCO space now for a very long time. It's not really any different from what we've been doing, to be quite frank. Um, Next thing we need to do is format that data. How are we going to format it? We know that everyone, all the log sources are all JSON, right? <laughs> um, generally, every log source is a little different. Um, another common problem that we have is um, you know, some might have like the net mask and some might have the CIDR. Or um, uh, another one is they might call fields and values different. So you might have a tool like Sysmon calling it source address, and you might have another tool calling it something else. So you have to figure out how to get it, all the data and then how to format it in some way that makes sense to you. Um, enrich the data into features. So features is really just this is what I want you to look at. I don't know why they decided to call it features. Um, but you hear them saying, oh, I'm going to engineer features, which really just means um, I have a data SAM set, basically, and that's a feature. So something like red on an, uh, what, what color is it? Red. So color is the feature. Um, next, we have to figure out how to process the data. Um, and then we have to present it in some meaningful way that makes sense, plus makes our managers happy and makes them feel like we're doing work. Um, from my experience, almost all the work is from gather to enrich. The, actually, the back end stuff is actually pretty easy. Um, like isolation force, I quite frankly don't even understand how it works. There's a bunch of math to it. But you really just say, here are my features that I've spent like a ton of time getting them into the right format. Push it through some like 
algorithm and it spits something out. And you're like, OK, thanks. That's how most of the algorithms work. What's up? <laughs> I, I don't know because at least for me that's the hard part like you spend a lot of time it's not easy I I, I don't know <laughs> it, it is it's it's the hardest part is like getting them into the correct format and then knowing what algorithm sort of does what and then just shoving it into the algorithm and it does magic um, is, is the majority of what what I've done um, all right, so how are we gathering data? Um, so first we have to figure out where we're gathering logs from. In DCO, it's mostly network data, host log data, application log data. There might be some sort of weird API calls, especially now with like cloud becoming a thing, uh, having to pull data from, from all over. Um, and then we have to figure out, is this data easy to work with? Like, it's gotten better. Most is either in XML or JSON these days, but it used to be like like sys, uh, syslog messages, for example, or just like ran, you know, just text, and that that's always great to have to deal with. Like, what what do you do with that data? And it's it's kind of a pain to deal with. Um, so, how are we going to pull this data? If it's structured, we're happy. Uh, if it's unstructured, we're a lot less happy. Um, but we have to figure out how to how to deal with that. So next we have to turn it into some sort of data frame. Um, so this is what they're, this is what basically is a two-dimensional array in the world of data science. Um, if you've ever dealt with uh, uh, two-dimensional arrays, you know it's really just columns and rows. In pandas, they call them series, so each, each row is a series. Um, <coughs> so um, I, I quickly learned when I first started with this, um, uh, I found out that uh, Pandas, which is the, one of the bigger uh, data frame libraries out there, it is iterable. So that means you can treat it like an array. Um, we then hired a data scientist who looked at it and was like, what the heck are you doing? Um, this is terrible. So I learned how to do it correctly is what I'm saying. And I'll show you kind of what it is. Um, the power of the data frame is that there are a ton of built-in functions that you, you can use to manipulate and, and extend that data very easily. Uh, so you can iterate over it. You can do like a for loop over all your data. Just don't do it. Um, so data frames, there's, as I was saying, there's, and I also found that not iterating is actually a whole lot faster too. Um, <laughs> um, if you have to pull data that is structured, so for example, CSV, XML, JSON, it is very easy to turn it into a data frame. Um, I found another library called Zat on GitHub, uh, which is Zeek Analytic Toolkit. If you have to deal with Zeek, uh, Zat is absolutely awesome. The other thing that's really great about it is they have a bunch of examples, which help me learn. <laughs> um, so they have like a bunch of just free examples to go out and, and do. Um, the one we actually also use extensively um, for, for the project we do is something called Eland. Um, Eland is for Elasticsearch. Um, it allows you to connect to an Elasticsearch cluster, and it allows you to almost treat it like pandas. Um, and if you can't treat it like pandas, you can press go, and it will turn from all your data from Elasticsearch into pandas for you. Um, and it is absolutely spectacular if you just so happen to have an Elasticsearch cluster. Um, so I wanted to spend a little more time on, on what are the types of data frames, just because that's a big part of this, is how we're going to organize that data. Um, Pandas, like I said, is awesome. There's tons of documentation out there. There's tons of examples. Um, it is very easy to use, and it's actually what I've built all my examples in, just because you can do it on your computer. Its biggest problem is it operates completely out of memory. So that means if you've got lots and lots of data, eventually you're going to need a bigger box, you're going to need a bigger box, you're going to need a bigger box, until you can't get a bigger box anymore. Um, 
So we have large boxes that have over a terabyte of RAM. So we can usually deal with a lot. Um, but at some point, it doesn't scale. Uh, you can't use multiple computers to kind of chunk at the data, to process it. Uh, it's, it's not the greatest if you have to deal with a lot. It is very good if you want to explore data because it's very fast and easy um, and well supported. Um, another one is PySpark. Uh, if anyone's ever dealt with Hadoop, it is loosely based off of Hadoop back in the day. Um, it works on something called MapReduce. Uh, the idea behind MapReduce is you take a large problem and you break it into multiple maps and you send it out to a cluster of a bunch of systems. Um, and then each of those systems kind of deals with their like chunk of the problem. And then at the very end, they bring it all back and it reduces it into a single answer at the end. Um, <clears throat> uh, it is uses also something called lazy evaluation. So unlike normal like functional program where, where it's like do A, do B, do C, you tell it, I want you to do A, B, and C, and go. It does everything all in one shot. Um, it is a little more complicated to use. You need an infrastructure of some sort. Um, but if you need to start scaling out, PySpark is a way to, to, to go. Um, Elands, as I was mentioning, uh, is the one we're, we're using extensively. Eland is exclusive to Elasticsearch. I'm sure Splunk probably has something equivalent, um, but we haven't, I haven't tried to use it. Um, Eland, you say, here's my Elasticsearch cluster. Um, one thing that's kind of neat about it is um, it lives on the Elasticsearch cluster, but you can treat it as pandas. So a lot of the functions that pandas has that can be supported, um, it, it supports as well. So um, it, all the data is still on disk. So when you hit go, it runs out to the cluster, which is multiple systems. It, it, it does take longer because it's not coming from memory now. Uh, it's coming from disk. Uh, and then it gives you an answer. Um, but it looks very much like pandas. Uh, there are a handful of functions that don't work in it. Um, just because Elasticsearch as an infrastructure can't handle that. Um, but if for some reason you want to take data from Elasticsearch and turn it into pandas, it's a single function call. And then it runs out, grabs all the data, and then you now have a pandas data frame, which is really nice. Um, all right, so uh, next we have to enrich the data. So we have to gather value out of whatever that data is. So that could be getting all the unique fields that are out there, uh, counting values in a field, uh, uh, calculating means, modes, entropy, whatever that is to build our features. So this is what you're looking for, and you're going to feed to those different algorithms. Um, Pandas does this really easily for you. Um, a lot of the like simple math things uh, that you would expect like mean, median, mode. You can basically say, take this field and apply median to every single field in that, and every single series in that, that data frame. Um, if you've never dealt with Lambda in Python, I never really, un I, I wouldn't say, I used to know how to use Lambda. Um, you have to learn Lambda. <laughs> Lambda in Pandas is huge. Um, so Lambda, I'll, I'll show you when we get to the, um, when I get to actually showing off some of the code. <clears throat> and then process. So we figure out what, what algorithm we're going to use, and we send it through a classification, regression, uh, unsupervised, all those crazy things we talked about. And then finally, we're going to present the data in hopefully some meaningful manner that makes our bosses think we're doing something. Um, there's a bunch of different libraries out there. Uh, Plotly is pretty cool. Matplotlib and Seaborn are, are, are some of them. And all right, so um, so here's my three demos. Um, all the code is on GitHub, so um, you can you can just download it today uh, and start looking at it. Um, so the first one is going to be machine learning and, and Zeek logs. We're gonna. This is probably the one I, I started with. I was actually pretty proud because I didn't really know what I was doing. This is where I started with doing the iteration and all that stuff, but. Um, at the end, I 
dumped, a, I had a bunch of Zeke logs, I dumped it in. I was like, okay, this is cool. And I was like, all right, at the end, I dumped in an, a known DNS tunneling thing and it popped up right away. So I was pretty cool because I, I didn't like reverse, like how can I make it find this thing? Um, so data analytics and Apache logs, and then we'll, we'll look at Sysmon logs as well, uh, just to detect odd executables. Uh, talk a little bit about DNS tunneling in case someone hasn't dealt with it in the past. Um, so what DNS tunneling is, it's a common technique used by bad guys or red teams uh, to basically exfiltrate data. It's usually used for command and control. Uh, so you have malware on a box somewhere and you want to be able to periodically send short messages out of the network and uh, you want to be able to get short messages back into the network. The deviousness of this is it follows the standard DNS chain, and so it doesn't really ever connect directly to the, the bad guy's box. So um, in this hypothetical case, you have a client that usually points their DNS to some sort of DNS inside the enterprise. Uh, they're then pointed to whoever the enterprise decides, some root, root DNS server out there. Um, and then badguy.com registers badguy.com because he wasn't very creative and wants to get data out. So what happens is this malware will generally send what seems to be random strings of queries to badguy.com and then that will go to the enterprise's DNS and if it makes it out, they will say, where's badguy.com out on the internet to their internet provider? Uh, they will receive a, a request, and then they will run out to badguy.com. So the message is that random string of, um, random string of, of data. So it's usually encrypted in some way, shape, or form, or XOR or something. It doesn't, doesn't really matter too much. But... Um, they also, because DNS has a response, right, you can also send data back in. So you can send little chunks of data and like the IP address may be enc uh, encrypted or something encoded some way, shape, or form. All right, so uh, if you've never used Jupyter Labs, um, it is pretty cool. It, you, you can download it on Mac, you just do brew install Jupyter and you end up, it runs a little web server, and the nice thing about it is it allows you to mix code with like pictures and, and pretty text and so forth. It's just a really good way of presenting your data. Um, so um, what we're going to do is look for weird in, uh, in, in logs. So does anyone want to take a wild guess as to what features we're probably going to want to look at? And I've got prizes given to me by B-Sides for it. We've got two prizes. All right. Large spike, so frequency. I'll go with that one because that's one of them that I got. What do you have? Entropy, yep. So that's one I've got. Uh, has anyone else got other ones? FQDN length. FQDN length. Um, yeah, but so with that one, we're going to look at the subdomain, right? The, the actual, yeah, so I guess the FQDN length would work, right? Because that would contain uh, the subdomain, so sure. Um, so yeah, that's more or less that's it. But the important thing is, is I don't specify the rules. So I don't say like Suricata, I can easily say, uh, if you see an FQDN length of more than 50, send me an alarm. I don't really care about that. All I say is look at these things and tell me what you see that looks weird out of this. Um, so to start off, uh, we install a bunch of, can you see that okay, reasonably? Um, a bunch of libraries. So I mentioned Zat, Zeek Analytic Toolkit. Um, it is free and it is very cool. Um, Pandas, sklearn, Plotly for making pretty pictures as well. Um, do some imports. Um, the reason that uh, Zat is really cool is all I do is I feed it Zeek logs and it turns it into a Pandas data frame. Uh, it's pretty, pretty simple. 
Uh, if you've never seen Zeek logs, this is the default format, uh, which is just it's rows of data with all the other ones. Does that also supports it in JSON if that's how you're doing it, um, which you probably are. But um, so either way, uh, if you if it's JSON, it's just like an extra flag. You just say this is JSON, and it, it deals with it exactly the same, um, and it turns this into a uh, uh, a data frame. So each of these rows is a series, and you can see that more or less, oops, um, it looks exactly like you would expect something like Excel or something like that to look. Um, all right, so <clears throat> next we need to enrich the data, right? So uh, calculate entropy. You can see I put a entropy function, which is Shannon's entropy. Um, which I got off of Wikipedia, uh, not very difficult. Uh, so this basically gives you a number between 1 and 5 based on what the overall entropy is, like how random that, that string seems to be. Um, and then we can start querying out different fields from, uh, from that, that data series up. So in this case, uh, Zeek data frame, uh, there is a should be one called query up here, right? We can see that that is more or less what was asked for, <clears throat> and um, note that I don't have a for loop, right? So I all I say is on each query, I want you to calculate out the length of the string and assign it to the query length. Pretty easy. Um, next up, we do something. Here's a lambda function, we say um, each query, I want you to apply this. So we're going to split based on the first period and grab the first um, item of that array, so which is going to be the subdomain. Uh, return it as x, and we're going to assign that value to the subdomain string. Right? Um, register domain string is going to be the rest of, of the array, so everything other than the first item. Um, subdomain length. We just calculate out the length of it. Subdomain string, here's the subdomain string. Um, and then we take the subdomain string, in this case, and we apply it to that entropy function up here. And we pass it down, and we give it uh, the subdomain entropy. Uh, and we end up with a new, well, it's, it's the same data frame with some extra fields that we added. Pretty, pretty simple. Um, <laughs> If you look at the very first thing that comes out, because I sorted by subdomain entry, that doesn't look normal. <laughs> um, but we continue on. Uh, some of this is my house network. So you know that IoT devices, they tend to do lots of weird things. Um, so, uh, but you can see some of the stuff. We've got pirate.c is making these weird things. Uh, I would probably stop there and start looking at pirate.c, but we can continue. Um, all right, so uh, what do we do next? So we want the data based on subdomains, right? So hypothetically, what is the average of all the, the subdomain queries for that registered domain? So we're going to break it now down into the registered domain and calculate out averages. So we're going to take everything and what is the average entropy going to that ROP TCP local, which is an IoT thing, uh, going out to Amazon AWS and, and so forth. And you can see the numbers down here. We add the average length and then the frequency, so total number of, of requests that were given. Um, <clears throat> And we get to the isolation forest portion. Um, we say these are our features we want you to look at. So average entropy, average length, and frequency. Um, and we mostly just copy and paste examples <laughs> um, from, from isolation forest. But we turn everything. Uh, so we have the subdomain features. Um, we create predictions. So this part is the isolation forest portion. So this is going to take a subset of our data and say and flag everything as anomalous. So in this case, we mark anything as negative 1 if it decides it's anomalous. It doesn't really know like what's bad. It just says, this looks like it's different from all the other data you fed me. Um, and then next thing we're going to do is we are going to break it into clusters using k-means. 
So we're going to take all the anomalous data and we're going to say group them in the clusters. In my case, I did four. How did I come up with four? I just tried it. It was like, do I see anything with four? Do I see anything with five? Um, and until you get something that looks reasonable. Uh, and then we apply everything. Uh, I'm going to add the registered domain back. Uh, and we run isolation forest. And we end up with four clusters, 0 through 3. Um, what is the weird data of this? And we can see the first cluster, 0, looks very bizarre. And probably we need to look into more, right? Uh, it's hex strings. I don't know why, but it's, it's hex strings. Um, we can see some other ones, like you know, this, is, it's, this one's kind of interesting. Uh, some of this ended up being, like these two are, were a lot of IoT devices. Uh, the nice thing about this is once we've done this, it's actually easy to take new data. And you can say, basically, if anything falls into the future in cluster 0, I want to send an alarm. So we don't have to like, we train, we have a data, we train it, and if it falls in the cluster zero in the future, give me, give me information. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, I love Plotly because it makes really, really cool stuff. Uh, this isn't really related to the, the machine learning portion, but um, it lets you make these like interactive charts that uh, are based on frequency, length, and average entropy. And you can like mouse over them. Um, and you can kind of see that a bunch of the data ends up popping out in its own little cluster over there. So that's kind of kind of neat. Um, and so that is that. Uh, the next one was Apache logs. I started off asking my company if they could give me a bunch of Apache logs. And they said no, because um, they couldn't show it off. Maybe. I don't. You could probably tell me why it is better. Like um, finding like a line of best mode is, is there a regression? Regression? Yeah, probably. Um, it's not time series. Uh, so you'd have to, you could. I, you could try it. I mean, it's mostly just try it and see what happens, right? Um, I, I will say, like, I, I've I spend ideas. I'm like, what happens? And half the time, it, it doesn't produce anything of value, right? Um, I'm sure there's other things we could do for that. Um, so Apache logs, I, my company was like, you can't like share our, our Apache logs. So I found that in Google, if you type in um, in URL access logs and file type dot log, you'll find people who publicly have their access logs for some reason served on the internet. So we're using a philosophy association's uh, access logs to look at. Um, so it worked out. Um, in this case, uh, access logs for, uh, let's see, Apache. Yeah, so these are access logs for Apache. Uh, for the most part, it's time. Um, and then what was requested, get post. Uh, there's some other data for, for um, the different user agent strings and so forth. I did find, um, I found examples of how to parse uh, Apache logs. But the big problem with Apache logs is they're configurable. So everyone's Apache logs are going to be a little bit different. So you kind of have to deal with that. Uh, so you have to be like, OK, this is this field, this is this field, this is this field, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's not too hard. I started with that and was able to quickly figure out how to do it um, based on that code. We turn that same data into, uh, into a data frame. Uh, we start enriching the data. So in my case, I'm looking at the different URIs that were requested. I do, again, things like um, what are, 
I messed with like user agent strings um, as well as doing entropy and so forth. Uh, so get user agent statistics. What are the unique uh, user agents that are being presented as well as their frequency? We can see that Googlebot, for example, ends up being pretty heavily used. Um, let's see what else there is. Uh, get URI statistics. So this is, um, by the end of this, I take all the URIs. I, what is the frequency that they're being uh, requested? What's the length of them? Entropy, variable length, and then the variable entropy. So that's for like passing into applications and so forth. Uh, push them all that data back in the original data frame. So I'm adding all that data back. Um, and then I start getting statistics about based on IP address. So here's the IP address. It had this many requests. It had this many failures. Um, they tend to have this much entropy coming out of each one uh, and so forth. Uh, I turned this into a pretty picture again. I didn't see anything that really stood out. Maybe this one, this IP address seems to have a high failure frequency, but it, it's probably some sort of bot or something. Um, I don't have control of the server, so I can't really, really look too much further into it. Um, and then some URIs plotted based on, on information about the URIs. Uh, might be some data value. Uh, and then more or less the same thing. Uh, take it, uh, in this case I used eight clusters as opposed to four. And you're just trying to look, are, do any of these items mean anything of use to me? Um, and if they do, you can, you can use them. Uh, all right. Yeah, 15 minutes. Uh, Sysmon data. How many people have worked with Sysmon data? What, what is it mostly in? XML, right? XML is wonderful. It's very easy to parse. Um, I couldn't find a good data set uh, for XML, so I started doing this. Um, there is an example of how to parse Sysmon, which is mostly copied and pasted from someone else's GitHub. Um, but what I did find is MITRE publishes something called Brawl, which is apparently some exercise that they run. Um, and they publish it in JSON, so it's not exactly the same format. But it is some exercise they did. There's some sort of like environment, and they have automated attacks of some sort going on. That's about all I know from their, their GitHub. So uh, I don't know too much more about it, but it provided me the data set that I was trying to find. Um, so it's not exactly in Sysmon format, but I think it, it works. Uh, more or less, I took the data and uh, I turned their JSON, uh, and one of the problems that they had was they have like their own weird format. So like they have like game ID and stuff like that that's tacked on there um, that I just had to deal with, which it wasn't a big deal. And then I can after that I can start treating as if it were Sysmon. Um, then what I did was I took all the executables that were that had logs. Um, and I started looking at how many systems ran each of these executables, right? How many users ran these executables? I thought that would be interesting. Um, and you end up with something like this um, that you can look at. Oh, I also had connection count, so the number of connections that were being made uh, to, to a network. Um, and then I ran it through isolation forest. And if you look carefully, you will see one of the clusters has like philadelphia.exe and west.exe running out of the C directory. Um, we could see that it ran, I want to say, didn't make a lot of connections. It's kind of hard to see with it zoomed in. Um, but it's more or less based on how many boxes that it ran on the total network. Um, so that's, that's what I've got. Um, is there any questions, comments? Um, so 
so that's how we do things on my contract. We're pulling data from that and doing analysis. The one thing that this is good for that you can't do in like Kibana very easily all the time is being able to add data. So like the problem if you're familiar with Elasticsearch, it's somewhat immutable once it's in there. So um, you can't like add fields very easily. You can do things like calculate the mean and, and so forth, but I can't like pivot off of that data. So like the Zeek example, I can't easily say, okay, I want you to add a new field of a statistic that I have found on more advanced statistics, if that makes sense. But you can very easily do this with Elasticsearch as the back end, and that's, that's how we, we generally do things um, a way. Yeah, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. I forget what library it does that, but you can you can take these cool like the these things and you can publish them to to a Kibana, which is something we found. So for the last you can use them like a new branch tool to use the last week. So you can someone can use like you're showing, but I'm just thinking with like search queries. <clears throat> Um, intuition <laughs> um, is one. The other thing is if you have access to either red team reports or like, you know, all the CrowdStrike reports and stuff like that, look at prior attacks and like literally just go through the report and be like, okay, you know, they list a DNS query was made. What was the unique thing about that DNS query that ended up being of value to their investigation, right? So if I didn't know where to start, that would be where I would start. Um, as well as just if you have experience doing this type of work, like stuff like that, you tend to know like, okay, these things are tend to be the things that I look for. The other thing could be just ask analysts, like watch an analyst and see what they're looking at and have them describe why they're looking at it and then write it down would be the, the areas I would look at. Anything else? Um, so usually what we're doing is we're building models and then we're flagging on the models in the future. So it's more like we, we try to come up with something of use and if it ends up being of use, we do the, the fit and then it's like, hey, you know, this went into cluster zero, send an alarm or something like that. So uh, where I would see you have to retrain the model is anytime there's a significant change to the network or if you're finding that you know, for some reason, like this was working six months ago, and now all of a sudden it's been giving me a lot of false positives or something along those lines, and you just have to rerun it. Um, but the ideal scenario is you don't have to run this all the time. You just, you have a large data set, you run it, 
It takes a while. It eventually builds out a model. If you can take these models that are made and you can pickle them. I don't know if you're familiar with pickle. For You can literally just pickle it. And then from there, you can utilize that model. And you just say, hey, I have a new data. What cluster does it fall into? And it's not like retraining the model. But what it is doing is it's, it's clustering. And you just let it run until it, it's not providing value anymore. And then you recreate it. <clears throat> Yes. So we, we are using something called Kubeflow, um, which is a, uh, it's, it's open source. It's, you can run in the cloud if you want. We're doing it locally. Um, and Kubeflow allows you to do that. So mostly we would explore with something like this. And there's actually Jupyter Notebooks built into Kubeflow, which is really slick. Um, and then if we find something that we think is of value, we'd probably rewrite it in PySpark. Um, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of PySpark because what I found is it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's Python because it's PySpark, but it's actually just a wrapper around Java. So like you, it's very bizarre because like things aren't the same. It's like it's close enough to Python, but it's not actually Python. Um, but it is, it is more distributable and so forth. So that's the benefit to it. Um, but Kubeflow allows you to distribute out to a large set of clusters, more or less. Five minutes. Anything else? Questions, comments? I would be very reluctant to block right now based on anything I've seen. So I usually, like with a, if you know like Suricata, you can block or you can not block. I would probably at this point not block. I think where it would potentially be of value is is really just taking reducing our work, right? Um, instead of hundreds of false positives, maybe we only have fifteen <laughs> or something like that, as well as presenting information that we don't actually know. Like, I think that's really the benefit is like, hey, I send it into an unsupervised learning, and it sees something that's weird. Is that actually weird? I don't know. Um, just sort of checking our, our, our preconceived notions and so forth is where it, where it can be useful. Um, I, I don't think I would let it like just start running a muck on my network and like controlling it and like, hey, I see something. I'm going to kill that host because it's now anomalous, right? Um, I would not trust it for that yet. <laughs> are, you, are you very active on social media just sharing of this type of information? Uh, no, other than what I've got. Um, not entirely, no. This is, this is about what I've got. <laughs> so, all right, anything else? And I can't also share directly like the stuff that we actually do either, so that's the other problem. So all this was like mostly me learning of what I'm supposed to be doing. So um, I just started messing around locally before I started doing it at, at scale. Yeah. We tend to hate like repetitive jobs. And this is where this is a lot more fun than a repetitive job. Um, that's the other thing. Like, I, instead of going through thousands of logs, I would much rather like try to convey something to a computer and have it do that for me. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you very much. You can grab me. Anytime and ask more questions. <laughs>